All right, I'm now recording. And so let me do our introductions. Here we are. Catherine Silva is a main author of dark fiction, a connoisseur of coffee, and victim of cat shenanigans. She is a two-time Maine Literary Award finalist for speculative fiction and a member of the Horror Writers of Maine, Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance, and New England Horror Writers Association. Catherine is also a founder of Strange Wilds Press, Dark Taiga Creative Writing Consultations, and the Cat at Night blog. Her latest book, The Wild Dark, is due out October 12th. It was already out. And you can find out more at www.catherinesilvaauthor.com. I also want to put a plug in that we have her book here at Vos Library. And what better night to have Catherine Silva with us then with our beautiful harvest moon, it is very airy out there, and the moon is doing quite a dance. And so I am so excited to introduce Catherine. I'm going to step away so you all can see her on the screen. I'll stop sharing. Let's put the speaker mode on. And Catherine, you can take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I also want to put a plug in, uh, just like recently I became a member of the Horror Writers Association as well, which is sort of like the giant one, <laughs> which is really exciting. So, yeah. um, I'm going to be reading a selection of The Wild Dark this evening. Um, I will be starting in Chapter 1, just to get things rolling. So, the, um, and a brief uh, description about what the Wild Ark is, it's uh, the story of an ex-cop who is uh, trying to survive a, an apocalypse in which a forest is taking over the world um, while being haunted by the ghost of her ex-partner. And uh, it's very, I, I'd call it a slow burn horror, so it's, it's very moody and dark and spooky, uh, less gory. Gross. <laughs> um, so, we'll let's do chapter one here. Here we go. One. Dreams cocooned me, wrapping me in their silky embrace like a thousand scarves. I didn't care if I never woke. In them, I wasn't guilty. I wasn't alone. All was as it should be. But something yanked me out before I was ready to leave. I opened my eyes to the darkened room. Rain poured outside, its white noise a strange comfort outside my bedroom window. I pulled the thick wool blanket closer. The small room had put me on edge at first, before I knew where everything was. As the days passed, I recognized the outline of the chair next to the door, the trunk full of blankets at the end of the bed, the small flickers from the fire in the wood stove outside my bedroom door. This place had become more than a temporary retreat. I turned onto my side and looked out at the rain. Why did I wake up? A board creaked on the porch. I stilled. It wasn't the old cabin making its usual sounds, the structure groaning in the wind, pipes rattling, treads loosening on the stairs out front. This was something heavy walking across the floor of my front porch toward my door. No one lived within several miles of this camp. I was in the middle of the woods. I slipped my legs out from under the covers, goosebumps instantly growing on my skin. Quietly reaching behind the side table, I curled my fingers around the baseball up there. An inch of safety nudged me as I tiptoed to the window and peered out. The bushes blocked most of my view, and the downpour made it hard to make out any shapes in the night. It could be anything, I told myself as I slid my sweatpants from the top of the chest and pulled them on. I crept toward the main living area. Another window looked out on the deck next to the front door. I steeled myself as I looked out. The deck was cloaked in shadows. To my left was an upright shape, a person walking in an ungainly way. They shifted back and forth as though they couldn't get their balance. It must be some drunk hunter looking for a place to sleep it off, I thought. I kept a firm hold on the baseball bat and moved to the front door. The memory of my days as a cop rushed back to me like an old friend. 
It had been months since I'd carried a badge. But more than anything, I wanted to see the look on this guy's face when I ripped open the door and shouted at him to get down on the ground with his hands behind his back. He'd probably pee his pants. He'd probably stumble off the deck and run back into the rain from wherever he'd come from. Then I could get some sleep. The creek stopped in front of the door. I braced myself, my hand on the doorknob. As I readied myself to jerk open the door, cowardice got the better of me. Who's there? I called. There was no answer. Not even the sound of another footstep. Hello? Do you need help? Are you lost? Nothing. The rain was pretty loud. Maybe they hadn't heard me. I turned the knob. Drowned by the deluge and wind, a faint voice blended with the static ambient. Liz. My name. They'd said my name. As quickly as I could manage, I jerked the door open and swung my bat up. Who the hell is... The voice echoed into the empty night. I frowned and stepped out onto the deck, looking from left to right. There was no one. I stopped at the edge of the deck, staring into the bushes. Water splashed against my bare toes as I tried to find some shape hiding within. I couldn't have been hearing things. There'd been a shape out here. The creaking was loud. I checked the other side of the deck. No one. There weren't even any wet shoe prints on the wood. A twig snapped in the trees. I trained my sights on them, squinting through the deluge in the dark. Something stood there, staring straight at me. The eyes were golden, barely catching the licks of firelight from within the house. A loud growl, ro growl. A loud growl rose up. I took a step back, a board squealing under me. I glanced down for only a moment. The brush rustled as something dashed off into the thicket. I backed into the cabin and locked the door behind me. The crackle of the wood stove seemed loud in the quiet space. I added another log to the fire and stirred the embers with my poker. I wasn't going crazy. Someone was here, a human someone. Grabbing a fleece blanket from the chest in the other room, I curled up in the chair in front of the fire and stared through the glass window into the stove at the flames. I listened for anything out of the ordinary. I had to have imagined it all. I waited for sleep to take me, but I was too wired. The voice on playback in my mind. I forced my eyes to close and lay my head against the soft upholstery. The sounds of the rain merged with the crackling of the fire, washing in and out of my ears. The heat warmed my chilled skin, and the blanket suddenly became another world of comfort. Even in sleep, that voice called to me from the darkness. I knew that voice, and it knew me too. No amount of sleep could change the impossibility of that voice's owner being here now. He was gone. He was dead and gone. Then, now. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm calling it. We're heading back, Liz. My partner's voice echoed through the trees. If I squinted, I could make out the beam of his flashlight and the outline of his body. I trudged toward him, my boots snapping on twigs and squelching in the mud. My rain, well, my rain poncho was sopping inside, and the cold had penetrated me to my core. The storm was still hours from being over. Liz! No! I broke into the clearing. Brody Aritza emerged seconds later from the opposite side, a soaked black rain jacket covering his shoulders, his slacks splashed with mud above his boots. His always dark and searching eyes were on fire. What do you mean, no? The next team is here. It's time for us to pack up and go home. I took a couple steps away from him. We should check down by the river again. What? He shouted. The pounding of the rain nearly drowned out his voice. I turned back. The river! Lennox's guys cleared the river. You know that. There's always a chance they miss something. Liz. I headed back in the direction I'd come from. We need to check again. Brody ran after me, boots splashing and sucking in the wet earth. They've been thorough. It's a missing girl, and they know the risks. The next team will check again. We've been out here for over 18 hours. A balloon of defeat rose in my chest. I slowed to a stop. She's only eight. She couldn't have made it too far. They'll do their best to find her, but I'm beat, and I can tell you are too. I'm okay, he scoffed. You've got circles the size of frisbees under your eyes. 
I heard a wet slap behind me and turned to see the sight of Brody on his knees in the mud. I stepped back and helped him up. Fucking hell. He wiped his hands on his pants. It's Thanksgiving. Go home and eat some turkey. I stared off in the direction of the river. I could almost imagine it through the trees, a churning mass of black water and the stone bridge that crossed it. Little Chloe Clark could be crouched with one of her Barbie dolls, pretending they were hunting lost treasure. Her imagination gets away with her, her mother had said as she feebly held a glass of water and took small sips. She wanders sometimes. A couple days ago, she said she saw big dogs in the woods. She went looking for them, I'm sure of it. We didn't have wolves in Midcoast, Maine, and no one in the Modders Hill area owned big dogs. It could have been a black bear, but there was no evidence of one having been near the Clark residence. No paw prints, no scat, no scrape trees or carcasses. Hey, Brody came around in front of me. Did you hear me? I sighed. She has to be out here somewhere. His eyes softened. It's two o'clock in the morning. The next team has hotter coffee and fresher eyes than we do. They'll find her. He put his hand around my shoulder and turned me back around. We walked through the woods, slopping through puddles, climbing gnarled roots and slippery hillsides until we reached Brody's, Brody's black Dodge Charger. Slipping our rain shells and blasting the heat, we drove back to the station. The city of Flintland was cloaked in woolly blackness. The frosty globes of street lamps were our only guide along the roads. Each avenue of darkness was spotted with signs of New England architecture. Main Street was lined with brick and mortar businesses and Georgian buildings. River Road had Old World's white salt boxes. Flintland greens with crisp federal stone rows and the occasional Victorians, all punctuated by silent sidewalks. The sound of rain and Brody humming Neil Young's Harvest Moon made me feel like I was inside a warm dream. We stopped at the only 24-hour convenience store in Flintland for coffee and day-old breakfast pastries. I hadn't realized how hungry I was with the adrenaline fueling my every move. I practically devoured my stale apple turnover before we left the lot. I didn't even buy a turkey, I said, wiping the crumbs from my blazer. They stuck, in, they stuck to the wet fabric regardless. Brody frowned. Seriously? He opened the glove box in front of me. A wad of napkins rested inside. I grabbed one and dabbed at my blazer. I was going to get Chinese. Brody scoffed. What are you, 19? Last time I tried to cook a turkey, it turned it into jerky. Josh had insisted on cooking the turkey since then. Fine then. You're coming to our house. He popped the rest of his blueberry donut in his mouth. I glanced at him. You've got family coming in. I don't want to mess up your plans. Brody rolled his eyes. It's Carmen's mom and her sister, Carrie, the annoying one. I told you about her, right? Yeah, she has a new boyfriend every six months. Besides, I'm pretty sure Carmen bought a turkey the size of a water buffalo. Probably wouldn't even fit in the oven. All right, all right, you made your point. Back at the station, we changed into a couple of two large cotton shirts left over from when the station sponsored a 4th of July community marathon. As I stuffed all of my wet garments into a gym bag and left the locker room, Brody approached from his desk, his own black bag slung over his shoulder. They're going to find her, Liz. I locked eyes. I wish I was back out there. He blinked slowly and walked by me, resting a hand on my shoulder. Go home, he repeated. You've got to spend some time there eventually. The door squeaked shut behind me. So, yeah, that's that's all I'm going to share from chapter one. Um, and I think now I'm going to surge forward and share a spot later in the story, once it starts getting a bit spookier. Um, And I will paraphrase exactly what's happened between then and now. Um, eventually, once I find it, I apologize. Um, so, here we go. So, um, we're into chapter six now. Um, since then, 
Liz has met a park ranger by the name of Hank, who lives uh, in New Hampshire, where she is staying. She is staying at a, at a cabin in the woods for a month to sort of get over her grief, and um, since Brody is dead, which was sort of uh, hinted at in the first chapter, um, and is about ready to head. She's about ready to head back to Flintland and home, um, but has decided to stay one more night in the cabin before she does so. Um, and Hank showed up at the cabin looking for a missing person earlier in the day, um, and then invited her to go have pie at the diner because he's a sweetheart. <laughs> um, so now she's gone to sleep at the cabin, and yeah, here we go. Uh, I opened my eyes, my mind scrambling to detach myself from the world of sleep. I peeled back the covers and stood, backing against the wall as I tried to remember where I was. The pops and crackles of the fire in the den comforted my ears and my pounding heart slowed. The cabin. I was here and Brody was not. A sound pierced the air. Not any sound. A scream. I reached for the baseball bat, leaning against the wall where I'd left it after last night's disturbance. I slumped to the window. Everything was black. Only the shapes I could make out. The only shapes I could make out were the edges of the bushes and the treetops, branches crossing one another in natural filigree. The scream died off into the night. The tension in my shoulders subsided. That hadn't come from nearby. It was distant. Then, like a warning siren, it rose up again through the trees, closer now. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, only that it was primal and unnatural. Goosebumps rose all over my skin. I grabbed the flashlight from a shelf by the door and flipped it on, a beam piercing the darkness. Throwing my clothes and a coat on, I hesitantly opened the door. Bitter cold nipped at me within seconds of stepping out. Despite wanting to slip back inside, I closed the door behind me, then held the bat up defensively. The screen tore up into the air, near feet in front of me. Panic, sk panic skittered across my brain. I scanned the snow-covered trees as I walked to the edge of the deck. What the hell was I doing out here? Go back inside. I couldn't. That scream uncoiled a thread of recklessness in me, something I hadn't sensed ever since I'd lost Brody. Something that something was out there. Who or whatever it was probably needed help. Something crashed through the brush off to my far right. I swept the flashlight across the driveway into the trees, but moments too late to catch anything. The wind whistled against the cabin and shook the trees. The sound of sticks and scrub crackling is get, still getting closer. Who's out there? I called, my voice barely projecting. The sounds in the underbrush suddenly ceased. My nerve wavered. What if this was the person who'd been walking on my deck last night? The crashing in the thicket commenced again, still growing closer, louder, greater. It didn't sound like a person. It sounded much bigger. I glanced over my shoulder at the cabin door. Fuck this. It wasn't worth losing my life, thinking I was doing it for a good cause. If a bear lumbered out from those trees, I wasn't going to fight it. I turned on my heel for the door and wrenched the knob, but it stuck. I jiggled it, threw my shoulder into the wood, hoping for it to give away. The door wouldn't budge. Shit. I'd locked myself out. The car. I could still get there. I fished around in my coat pocket for the keys, my fingers swimming in warm, empty wool. I'd left them inside. Idiot. I backed up against the door. What do I do? What do I... The back door. There was a spare key back there. The owner of the cabin had mentioned it in his email. I slipped into the opposite end of the deck, staying focused on the, on the woods. I was afraid to look away, knowing the owner of those terrifying screams could appear at any moment. Once I made it down the stairs onto the snow, I stole toward the back entrance. My breath was heavy in my ears. The squeal of my boots through the fresh snow was ear-piercing. I couldn't hear anything behind me. I didn't want to. I rounded the corner of the cabin. A small staircase led up to the back door. In a box leaned up against the side of the building was a heap of rusted coffee cans, barely protected from the snow. I lifted the mat at the top of the steps, but found no key there. The owner must have hidden the back door key in one of the cans. A stick snapped toward the front of the house. 
I picked up the first coffee can, groping inside. Nothing. I tossed it and moved to the second. A crunch of snow froze me for a second. Masochistic curiosity begged for me to peek around the corner of the house. Do you want to die? I asked myself, checking another can. Maybe. Maybe that's the answer. A few seconds later. No. No, it's not. I searched another can. Still nothing. Footsteps slinked along the side of the house. Oh, please, come on, come on. Diving my hand into the next can, my fingernails curled around a key nestled in the soup of mud and slushy water at the bottom. I was at the back door in seconds, plunging the key into the lock, my breath rolling into the night air in anxious puffs. As the heavy footfalls reached the corner, I shouldered my way through the door and shoved it closed behind me. The house was stifling and dark, the fire in the wood stove roaring. I rested my back against the door, listening to the wood. The coffee tin rattled against a few others, and I held my breath. The boards on the stairs creaked slowly. Though I desperately wanted to move away from the door, I couldn't. Whoever was out there was right on the other side, as if they knew exactly where I was. For a few moments, I thought I heard breathing. <laughs> That's where I'm going to stop with Dale. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to give it away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Cool. Yes. Um, so the Wild Dark is the first in a what is a proposed series. Um, I am currently working on book number two. Uh, whether or not there will be any books after that, I have no idea one of those things. Maybe it'll call for another one, maybe it won't. Um, and I do not have copies of the book, unfortunately, to sell this evening uh, because they are lost in transit mm -hmm. somewhere between Connecticut and here. Uh, but I, I do have uh, a way for people to sign up for a copy if they would. So like, to in person here, I do have a um, an order list, and that goes for people watching via Zoom as well. I can take um, names and uh, how many copies you would like, also, um, and then arrange a way to maybe drop them off here for people to pick up if that's easiest, um, or if it is more convenient, you can also order them on my website. That is another option as well. Um, so yes, I guess we can maybe go to uh, doing some Q&A stuff if anybody does have any questions about the book. Your next book, are you going to use the same character as your heroine? Um, Spoiler alert, yes. <laughs> uh, she will be one of the one of the main characters. There is a secondary main character as well. Okay. Are you gonna sign the books that you that people want? Yes. Oh no, definitely. Sign? Yes. I will happily sign books. So tell us a little bit for those of us who don't really know you, I think I'm in a crowd, I'm in a minority in this crowd, <laughs> but tell us a little bit about you and who you are sure. and why this particular genre is what you, your passion is, why you like to write. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I, for those of you who do not know me, I am a union, was a union resident. I grew up in union. Um, going to this library. Right. Um, it wasn't here at yeah. the time. It was up in town, but that definitely fueled my love of books. Um, I would go there and just hang out for like hours, um, reading books and looking at covers and dreaming. Um, and as far as my love of horror goes, I think I've always just been drawn to spooky things. I've had a natural um, propensity to just really like uh, like dark subject matter. Um, we had a, a book that my mom used to read for, to me um, when I was a kid that was called The Little Old Lady Who Was Never Wasn't Afraid of Anything. 
I don't know if you remember it. I do. <laughs> but I loved that book. And I would reread that book over and over and over and over. And that was like my first induction into spooky <laughs> books. Um, and then from there, it was like Goosebumps and um, uh, Animorphs and a few other sci fi like type things. Um, and horror movies too. It's the same. Like I've always loved monster movies and Jaws and Jurassic Park are two of my favorites. So I like books that have monsters, and I like writing about monsters. There's monsters in this book. Yes, <laughs> so you know. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Of course. It's always nice to have a little insight. Um, you out there yourself, for sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Mid Coast in the book as the yep. setting, and so um, as I was reading, though I'm not from Maine, I I would have had to have had an atlas out or something. Um, to <laughs> are the towns fictitious? The names? Uh, a lot of them are. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I come up, there's a few different towns that are based on towns that do exist. Um, Cardend, which is where she's staying in New Hampshire, is um, is a fake town. Um, Middle Hitch, which is a town that she used to go to her summer home and is actually based on Jackson, New Hampshire. Um, and then Flintland is a fictitious town that is somewhere between, I would say it's before like Brunswick area, um, Freeport area, and it has a population somewhere between Portland and Bangor, mm -hmm. so um, they needed a, a fake city that was yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, there are no questions in the chat. Any questions here? <laughs> Inspiration for your characters? Um, there's a TV show that I watched a few years ago called Fringe, which is probably one of my favorite TV shows. Um, and the main character of that is definitely an inspiration for our main character in this book. And also, um, she has a partner in that show who gets killed off, like, I think it's the first episode of season two, which is really horrible. And it's their relationship that really inspired my, these two main characters. I wanted to, you know, did a little fan fiction -y what if, you know, what if they hadn't killed him off, or what if he came back as a ghost, or something to that degree. Who did your cover? Mm -hmm. I did. It's a beautiful yeah, cover. Yeah. Um, yeah. I found mm -hmm. some really gorgeous photos on, uh, there's a free stock photo website that allows you to use these photos commercial free. Um, and I blended two photos together and used them. And I was kind of surprised because they're both professional photographers outside of doing things on this stock photo website, but those were up there and available to use, and they are really pretty. Um, mm. How long have you been writing? Professionally, it's been about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. I published a book in 2010. I think my first one came out in 2010, uh, but I have been writing a lot longer than that. I have been writing ever since I could. And before that, I was drawing stories, so just the idea of creating stories has always been like something I found fun. So what number book is the Wild Dark. Uh, the Wild Dark is number six. Oh, that's um, I have the first three, oh, it's not even the first three, the first two are part of a series called the Monstrum Chronicles. 
uh, which is a, I would call it more conspiracy theory vampire series. <laughs> um, and then there's, a, there's three books in that series, and then I have a comedy that I wrote when I was having an off year. And then I have a uh, novella that I wrote called The Collection, which came out a couple of years ago, that is psychological horror, um, Lovecraftian, spooky. Um, and I'm working on a sequel to that. Mm -hmm. You have some anthologies that you Yep. And I, um, I actually have two stories in anthologies that came out. That are One just came out this past week. Um, that is the Northern... No. It's called Wicked Creatures. It's, a, it's an anthology all about monsters, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and I wrote a story about an Icelandic monster that has eyes that are on the side of its face and it smile, like this way, which is super frightening. Um, and then I have another story in an anthology coming out in an eco-horror um, book next month that's called Horophobia. Um, and that one is, is about a tornado that's bent on vengeance. <laughs> Are any of those anthologies for children, or are they, is well, everything adult? There, it's all adult. Uh -huh. I've, I've never been, like, I like things that are aimed at kids, but I, I can't write for kids. I mean, too much of a potty mouth. <laughs> so. Do you some things coming up for Halloween? I do. I have an event this weekend at Main Sport. Um, in Rockport, which is a Halloween reading series, um, which I'm doing with a few other people, uh, Kevin St. Jar, E.J. Facenda, and Meg North. Um, we're all reading spooky Halloween-themed stories. And uh, next Saturday, I'll be in Salem, Massachusetts, which <laughs> may be where I die. Um, <laughs> and I'll be with the New England Horror Writers there helping sell the new anthology. And next, oh, I also have another reading next week that's new. I forgot about that. Um, I think it's through Josh Gauthier's Facebook page. Uh, he's another, um, he's another main horror writer. Um, and that's also a Halloween reading event, which I'll be doing with Emma Gibbon and Renee DeCamillis. And next month, wow, I have all kinds of things. Next month, I'll be at the Toadstool Bookshop in Keene, New Hampshire, doing a reading and a signing. So, yeah. And of course, you'll share your uh, Union Vos Library oh, yeah. history. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I will. That's my, this is my favorite library, so, of course. Just wondering if there's, I'm going to poke my face in. Hi, um, just wondering if you have any questions for Kate. I'm not hearing any. I'm not seeing any. Nothing for me. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. All right. Um, are there other questions tonight here? Questions or comments? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, for the sake of the, the Zoom people, then I'm going to just stand in front here again and just do a little close out then. Um, that concludes our presentation for this evening and all of us at Vos Library. Thank you for attending our Vos or Virtual Wednesday series. And we hope that you'll spread the word and also join us 
next Wednesday, October 27th, when Tess Gerritsen and Jerry Boyle, two well-known mystery writers, host our Soup and Suspense event. So good night, everybody, on Zoom, and be well and stay healthy. Nice job. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to sign up for that. I'm going to ruin it for you. <laughs> <laughs> no.